for people. Oh, hello. Hey, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait um, for people to enter. Hope everyone's having a good day today. Hope you've got a cup of tea, a glass of water, ready to learn about the food industry. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> Sorry, we were a little bit late today. I hope I gave you guys time to get settled in wherever you might be. Um, are you guys ready to get started? Yeah? Okay. Oops, sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Make an Impact event. My name is Charlotte. I study international development and anthropology at Sussex University, and I will be moderating the talk today. All of the events this week are intended to inspire you into seeing the vast possibilities of the pro professional world and show you that you will pioneer your own unique career path by learning how others have done the same. Before we begin, I would like to quickly premise that any inappropriate comments, hate, or discrimination will not be tolerated and that by signing up to this event, you have agreed to comply with the Stu Sussex Students Union Zero Tolerance Policy. All that being said, I'd like to introduce you to Alejandro and Daniela. Alejandro is the CEO and co-founder of Cibo. He is a leader, an innovative entrepreneur, and an expert in business communications. Daniela is the COO and co-founder of Cibo. She's an innovative entrepreneur, interested in science, innovation, health, and environmental sustainability, while also being an advocate for Latin American women in STEM. Together, they utilize their passions to save the world by looking where no one else does with biotech and food tech to uncover the importance of waste and insects. By result, they act as perfect examples of people who have created a positive impact through their careers by creating a solution to a global challenge and turning that into a business. Without getting too deep into it, would you guys like to take it away? Sure, we'd be happy to. Thank you, Charlotte, and it's great to be here. Just to get started, we would like to say that this story that we're going to tell you today is not something that where you would have to remember everything. We just might, uh, to, we just want to share some specific points, but we want to say that it's a story of action, it's a story of struggle, it's a story of opportunity, and at the end of the day, it's a story of passion and commitment towards a vision and a purpose that we have. So we're gonna just share our personal story and we hope you enjoy it and you can make it your own at the end of the day. Yes, exactly. So let me just start sharing the screen. Okay. Perfect, so we would like to start today with this quote that we like from Walt Disney, who we all know who Walt Disney is. And basically it says the, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. So this is precisely what we did. The talk is called actually fall in love with the, with the problem, not with the solution. And the main reason why it's called that way is because everybody thinks that they have the perfect solution or the perfect idea. So many people have asked us where did the idea came from. And for us, it's not about the idea. It's about the problem that we discovered. Discovering the problem was the first step. And well, maybe you're going to tell them. Yeah, <laughs> basically, well, as we all know, um, the problems that well, the world has are basically related to the food industry and the food production system. So we all know that the food system is basically unsustainable. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions is continually on the rise. Um, we have a plastic waste problem. We have a food waste problem as well. And if, if it wasn't at all, 
um, we need to feed up to 10 billion people in 2050. So how are we going to do that? These are the main problems that we found and that we actually discovered about five, four years ago. And from my end, um, my personal perspective, um, I studied nutrition in college, so I am a dietitian, nutritionist, and it was it it just was meant to be that I found this and that I uh, understood how nutrition works and how the global food systems works, and my passion lied in global public health. I actually studied nutrition and I decided to do that because I wanted it to prevent diseases. My grandparents had died of non-communicable diseases, um, cancer and lupus. And it just made me work towards what can we, what is something that we do every day, eat, and that we, that we can use it as a tool to prevent something in the future. So it was definitely my it, it, it was what led me to study nutrition. And at the end of my career, my, well, my studies actually, I found out also about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that are basically the pathway to lead and to focus on the future. From that same point and, and to remind us of the big problems and challenges that we have in the world, Daniela and I usually say that uh, the, the problems that we have today uh, are putting at risk our life on the planet and are actually killing us. So that's why our focus towards the food industry is so important. It's so essential. It's so basic. It's everything that we're going to need, even if we go to Mars, even with the major technological advances, we're not going to be able to eat software or eat money or eat the robots. We need the basic food. And that's the importance of the farmers. That's the importance of the of the people, the elders, and then the other people that is in, in our background. And for us, it was a matter of looking into the past. And on that looking into the past, when I remember when I discovered the problem for uh, from my end was when I was very little. Um, the same as with Daniela, I, I discovered thanks to my grandma, who is uh, already passed, but. She taught me how to love the natural resources. She taught me how to be efficient. She taught me how to care about other people and how to care about these problems, not only by talking, but taking action. And this is basically where we made a transition. And when we met, uh, where we saw that we both had this passion, we both had this vision, we both had this uh, love for a problem but probably we didn't know how to fix it. And understanding that we didn't know everything was the first step in discovering the problem. After that, we decided to look for what Charlotte already mentioned and you probably already heard and got a little bit scared, insects. And well, just to talk a little bit about insects, uh, according to FAO, are the most sustainable and efficient uh, way to feed the world by 2050. That's the main idea that caught our attention. And the question that we asked ourselves was, why, how, and what are we going to do? And on that point, we both said together, why not? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> and with this why not, we basically began our journey into being in an insect business. And how Jim Ron already stated it, the best way to succeed in business is to be in business. So we basically decided to start trying to farm insects. That was the first step. And we well, bought our first, our first crickets. Um, they, I, wait. Oh. they died <laughs> um, when the first crickets that we, that we bought didn't make it. Um, we were still learning, so it was a, a trial and error kind of kind of way. And well, it took us about a year to finally master insect farming. We began with crickets, and when everything seemed to be on the right way, on the right path, we had been able to reproduce the crickets, and and we had found out 
what would be the business model, how we could take this into, into a business and turn it into a, a, a real solution, our insects died, all of them. And so we well basically that was on May 2019 um, that our crickets died, all of them. And that day, it was a it was a hard day because we had taken a lot of effort towards making this happen, and it it was just devastating to find out that the insects had died. Um, so that day, I remember I remember that Ali and I both had a discussion and it either decided to go all in or quit at, the, at that same moment. As you can find, well, I think that you can guess, we decided to go all in and basically just keep moving forward towards making insects well, part of our solution to the problems that we had fallen, fallen in love with. So basically we decided to start at, uh, taking action without knowing what was there, just by knowing that we needed to do something about this problem, we needed to learn more. But instead of using the typical excuse of we don't know enough, we don't have, we are not major in uh, biology, we're not major on entomology. Um, we are actually majored in myself in marketing management and in nutrition, as you know. Um, we said, well, it doesn't matter what you are majoring, what actually matters is what you do, how you take action. And this first step of taking action is daring to take action, having the courage to take action and accepting that failure may come in the way. That failure is part of the journey. Failure is not something that you can skip, but it's actually your best teacher if you actually embrace it and if you are brave enough. And on that point, as Daniela was mentioning, that we decided to go all in, it was another point of taking action, taking action towards the challenges that we were facing. And in this journey from starting in Costa Rica to be now in the Netherlands, starting with SIBO, um, we went through different stages of challenges. This one uh, of the insects dying is one that represents our one of our worst moments because we felt terrible. It was it was a really emotional moment for our, for us after being working on that for a year and a half. All of our efforts, uh, I had quit my job just to start with this completely after my grandmother passed. Uh, we already had over 20 farmers and families in, in Costa Rica that were happy to collaborate with this and that would get a lot of uh, income out of this. So it was a, a strong moment. And in, with this, we learned about how to deal with these challenges. And after that, we have dealt with a series of challenges from the government in Costa Rica not allowing insect production. We're still fighting on that. Latin America not having the situations that we have. Um, the challenges of not having enough money or not paying a salary for ourselves for over two years. Um, not knowing how we would uh, yeah, get an income for the company the next month or, or how to pay for the facility that we were building. Um, then the problems on the challenge that came out with the, well, the good news of traveling to Europe to scale the company, uh, we got stuck because uh, something that happened in the way, basically, the COVID restrictions for traveling uh, got us stuck in Costa Rica, so we couldn't keep moving the, the technologies, but we took action towards finding a solution towards it. And the process, we were also living in the UK for three months. Uh, we were unable to travel to the Netherlands, uh, so we decided to embrace the journey and expand our operations in the in the UK as well. And at the end of the day, those challenges just represent something as the virus. <laughs> it's another big challenge, but for us, it's a matter of how many things come uh, around us and how can we keep taking action to move forward. Um, I remember one phrase from uh, Denzel Washington, the actor, who said, don't fall back, fall forward. And that's basically what we have been doing. <laughs> Making mistakes, but moving forward. Not, not staying there, taking action continuously so don't, we don't get stuck with it then. Yes, that is precisely what we're doing and what we have been doing for the past year. And just to well, basically explain everything together, how we began farming insects in Costa Rica, then 
well, with the death of our crickets, and how we got to this place, uh, SIBO, right now. Well, basically, what we wanted to to just speak and 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 do at SIBO, what we do at SIBO, as I don't know if you already knew, um, but what we do and what we are, our purpose is to lead the food industry to a sustainable future. And we do this by providing these sustainable biomaterials from insects. So, but, but what is SIBO? Um, what, what does it mean? Would you like to well, explain? How the name relates to what we do and our, our purpose uh, happened when we discovered the problem. And, and when we are understood what we wanted to do. But just as a brief explanation, SIBO is the name of the main Costa Rican deity of the native Costa Ricans, uh, who taught the native uh, Costa Ricans how to use the, the natural resources in a responsible and sustainable way. So for us, that's basically what we want to do in the food industry. We want to change the basis of production. We want to help and collaborate with the biggest food corporates so we can actually change that basis without waiting for consumer behavior to change. And that's how our innovations are taught to be. Um, but maybe we can tell them a little bit about the crazy things that we're doing. Yes, definitely. So we began, as you know, insect farming. But what can you do with the insects? So we, as a first product or first development, we began with insect powder, cricket powder or cr cricket flour. and. Actually, in this past, well, and, but from the beginning, we knew that we wanted it to take it well, further. And we basically also realized that insects, as their nutritive potential that they have for global nutrition, we found out that they also were a source of healthy fats and fiber. So in this process, we began with the insect powder and now are developing our, our own uh, separation process to extract proteins, fats, and fiber. From each of these components, we can actually develop something even better and something new, and that can have a specific use for the food industry as well. So in other words, uh, for all not, uh, for all the, the expectators, uh, people who are watching the are not technical as myself. Uh, I usually explain this on knowing that an insect, some, something that as small as an insect can actually make a solution for so many things. And the main reason is that insects are like a periodic table of elements, basically. The different insects have different components, different atoms, different materials that we can use in different ways and are very efficient because they are small, of course, but because also they take the water from the air, they also are able to eat pretty much anything, and, uh, well, you don't need too much space to farm them. When we discovered that the insects could be separated into different components was when we had this epiphany of what else can we do? And we asked ourselves again, um, well, why not take in action and try to separate the components? And after that, we found out that we had this input of an insect and three main outputs, as Daniela was mentioning. The fiber, uh, which is called chitin, the, or the exoskeleton of the insect. The protein, which we already know, and it's usually uh, a joke in different countries where when you eat an insect, it's just like, it's just protein, don't worry. Well, it happens like that as well. And the, the fats are fats like the ones that you find in avocado or in salmon. So basically, we knew that we could use them. You knew with the, that that was uh, interesting. But we started asking other people in the industry, how can we use them? It's, this is the part of the how we did it. And after that uh, point that we figure out how to do it, we move forward to the next step, which was basically understanding our business model, our journey, and how everything that we had learned in the process has started to make sense. Precisely. And just to also make a really good point on this, because we, well, we've told you what we're doing at CIVO, how we're doing it, what are the, the innovations that we're developing. But of course, 
we need to know that good business is good for everyone. And so from the beginning, from the zero, the day zero, uh, we knew that we needed it to make a sustainable and ethical um, sourcing for these insects to be able to make it as, as a solution that we wanted it. So from day one, we basically designed a partner program in which, well, that's me in the picture, our production supervisor, Kevin, and two of our farmers that are, well, basically growing insects in Costa Rica. So we developed, as I was mentioning, the farmer program in which we train women in rural areas of Costa Rica to develop this activity, to farm crickets and become part of our supply chain. This is part of what I'm, what I'm saying about good business is good for everyone. This is not something that is just for us um, or our own company. It's something that we can take and, and make it good for everyone else. Basically, we thought about our business model being sustainable, being healthy, and being good for everyone from the beginning. It's not about social responsibility or thinking about the SDGs as a matter of uh, that social impact or something that you do when uh, after you are making some profit is a matter of taking it into that account on the structure of the business and having the measurements of revenue and having the measurements of impact included in the same thing. And this starts with you as, as a founder or with you as a person in any organization, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, or as, a, as your civic duty. Everybody can do it, but it's a matter of thinking about impact and how to be useful for the world first. Mm -hmm. That's why we say that a good business is good for everyone. It's a matter of thinking a little bit more, thinking how to challenge the system, the current system, the way that we all do it. And for us, in uh, being Costa Ricans, it was a little bit obvious having the insect farming program because that's how we grow coffee. That's how we, in a country that is very small and has all of these challenges, uh, collaborate together to have agriculture. And that's also how a culture is, is, is blended into something else. That's how we engage with the consumer, with the farmers. The farmers are the biggest influencers in the food industry, and they can actually change the world. The types of stories that we hear from these people from... Um, when we had these uh, perceptions of uh, as how difficult would it be for us to include this from the beginning, we challenged ourselves as well to understand whether we could do it or not. Because at the beginning we said, well, maybe this is something that we can do afterwards, as many people can think. And we understood very early on uh, that they understand this impact better than us. Uh, we remember one of the first farmers who told us, uh, we asked him, why is that it's so easy and for you to understand what we're trying to do when there are so many regulators, politicians, and, and other organizations, even investors, not understanding why we need this as a farming program and why we need to farm insects? And he just replied to me, well, the land has given us a lot, and this is time for us to give back. And that's the moment when I understood it, it is actually really simple. It's a matter of caring. And doing good is actually caring, caring about the world, caring about others. And that's what we understand about doing good business. It's about caring, it's about loving a problem, it's about loving it enough so you commit to it, so you don't quit, so you can keep moving forward when you fail, so you can keep moving forward when everybody is telling you that you cannot do it, uh, when you don't have the the little support sometimes at the beginning from your family, when everybody's saying that you're crazy. And, well, you just have to keep moving forward. Yeah, when everything <laughs> is going south, but you know that you want to do good, that you want to fulfill this, this dream that you have, this purpose that you have, um, this idea that you got, continue and keep moving forward. So... Our key takeaways, I would say, that we want to, to give to you today, it's basically, well, first of all, find a problem, or if you already find it, discover more about it, and, and really 
just start to understand it better. Understand the roots of the problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe what you're seeing as a problem, it is not the main it problem. Is mm -hmm. There is something behind. There is a why. Look for that why and why you care. That's all really important. The second one related to care, this is basically what we were discussing. And at the end of the day, it all comes back to if you care enough to take action, you will do it. You will do something. So care, care about the problems, care about the people, care about uh, the future, the present, care. Yeah, uh, as the Godfather used to say, it's just business. It's not personal. Well, here it is. Personal. It is personal. <laughs> Take it personal because is the world where you live in is the place where we are, and if you care about your surrounding, it's gonna start looking better after you start consistently taking action over it. And well, of course, the last one is again care for good, care to make a positive impact care to leave the other the others anyone that is surrounding you animals the environment people that they are better when you well when you get in touch with them or when you develop a solution with them or when you just talk with someone yeah it's not only about you is you care about if you care about something you understand that is not only about you and if you care enough you're going to inspire other people to take action. And with that thought, we hope that we can inspire you a little bit just to take one action. And today, we challenge you to make that action. Stop talking. Just start doing it. Maybe you don't know what to do. Just go ahead and commit. Tell someone what you're going to do. And then you're going to be, you're going to be challenged to do it. So on these days of quarantining, lockdowns, uh, challenge, is the moment where we can actually have this space to take action. And little by little, we all together can change the world. Yes, exactly. So thank you, everyone, well, for listening and for this opportunity to, to be here. So I don't know, Charlotte, if you have any any questions, yeah. thoughts, anything. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. Um, we do have a few questions if you guys are feeling ready to answer. Yes. Um, let's start with, do you see any major changes coming in your field that students should be aware of so they might be able to better prepare for their careers? Major changes in terms of? Um, in your field. In our field. Hmm. Well, I would say that, yes, it actually already happened once before the pandemic. It happened during the pandemic, and now it's happening afterwards. But it actually, the, the whole change here, I, I think, is not about the technology. It's not about knowledge. It's about perspective. It's about understanding why the technology and the knowledge is important. Um, there was one phrase that I, when I heard it, uh, I've been committing to that and is that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That's basically very interesting because once you understand that it doesn't matter how much you know, you can go ahead and study anything. Then you have to study I nutrition. Studied nutrition. <laughs> I studied marketing management, public accounting, project management. And for my family, it didn't make sense. But for me now, it makes a lot of sense. It combines into something I care about. It's about finding a way to make that that change. So, yes. on regards of perspective, um, for the world, and and I think this is something that a lot of people have and started to understand. Uh, the biggest companies have started to understand this as well. Um, that we need to look into the past to understand the future. It's not about looking how much we can develop the technology or how many other worlds we can conquer. Um, we don't want to become those aliens in the movies who are just conquering world. We have to take care of the past so we can understand how to not make the mistakes in the future. And that's the whole, uh, the whole reason why we go to school and we, why we do business and why we care. So I would actually not think too much about the field. I would think more about how the past relates to your field yeah. and how you care. Uh, impacts the surrounding. Yes, 
I completely agree. <laughs> Wow, that's definitely a very unique perspective that I haven't heard a lot of. So that's really insightful. Thank you guys so much. Um, another good question is, are insects an option for vegetarians or vegans? Oh, I love that, that that's, that, that's our favorite question. Um, well, they are and they aren't. <laughs> and it will depend basically on the, the reason why a person is vegetarian or vegan. And of course, insects are animals. But well, for instance, in our in our production system, we do make sure that we farm the insects at the end of their lifespan, and we make sure that we treat them in the most ethical way, uh, not to procure any harm. So this is this is also something to take into consideration. It's actually a, an ethical process that we have there, so the, the insects doesn't don't suffer and. Also, insects are more similar to plants than to any other animal. Yeah. So, and at the same time, are more efficient than a lot of other types of farming. So, if we think on harm, on terms on how much harm are we making to the planet as well? Not only uh, how if the animals are suffering, is is the planet suffering? At the end of the day, the the whole idea of having humans in the planet. In the world is suffering, so we just have to find the most sustainable way, the most appropriate way. And on the regard of the specific question of for vegetarians or for vegans, we have studied this a lot and we have asked a lot of people and we have tested um, a lot of uh, areas in different countries, in Latin America, in Europe, in the US, and the same conclusion, uh, the conclusion the is always the same. <laughs> Two out of three vegans, vegans, would actually eat insects. And the main reason is that the first type of vegans are the ones who care about the environment and the animals. Though those ones understand and, and more they understand the process of insects and the way out that we do it, they would be open for that. It's a matter of how you do it as well, with any, as with anything. Um, the second part is the, the trendy. There is a lot of people that are going into trends uh, like organic uh, materials or, or yeah, the vegan, vegetarian. There is always a group of, of people that are going into this for trends. And there is the third type of people that is people who would never eat an, uh, an animal. And that's okay. We don't want to convince everybody. That's why uh, the whole diet should be a balance and the whole consumption should be balanced as well. Yeah. As a vegan myself, you know, I'm definitely interested in what you guys are doing. I think your initiative is so great. So. If you ever come back to England, do let me know. I will be here to take your <laughs> crackers. <laughs> um, <laughs> another good question is, are there any downsides to using insects in your view? I would say yes. Um, at the moment, the main downside has been regulation <laughs> and international trade because it's something that it's not new necessarily new. Um, to, but it's new to the world and to the Western world, precisely. So it has been quite a struggle to get um, the governments and the yeah the institutions, public institutions, to understand how to deal with this type of products. And yeah, I think that would be the main. Yeah, and the <laughs> other part is uh, that, as you know, with any type of production, it could be. Um, someone could take it on the wrong way. So for example, uh, you know that fruits are really nice and are really good for you. Uh, but there are many places uh, in our home country as well where the pesticides have been used a lot. So if we're gonna do a farming process, we need to make sure that it's done right. And that's why we, at the end, end up with this doing, uh, or good business must be good for everyone. We have to think about how we farm, how we do it. And the fact of farming insects in um, countries where you're gonna need a lot of electricity, well, that's gonna be another problem. So that's why we are committed to do it in Costa Rica or other tropical countries. So we have the condition, the weather conditions there, the natural conditions, and we avoid any other type of harm to the insects as well. Yes. Thank you guys. There are so many great questions. The audience is... <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's um, staying on the topic of insects, what actions can we take to help to help make insect protein a more mainstream future of diet? Mainstream future of future diets. 
well, eat it, <laughs> include it in your in your diets. I mean, um, go if you find there are plenty, plenty of, of insect uh, businesses in, in Europe as well. So if you find one or ours, <laughs> um, buy it and 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 try it. Basically, yeah. The the basically a lot of people uh, complains about the initial price of a new product. And we know during this pandemic has been difficult. And a lot of this type of businesses are struggling because uh, usually the people resistance is great at the beginning. And so on that end, I would say, well, first, dare to try them. There first, before saying no, and before <laughs> saying, oh, it's disgusting or this and that. If you don't like whole insects, you don't have to eat them. You, I'm, I don't see anybody just biting a cow on the street. <laughs> basically you're gonna eat a burger and that's nice and you like it probably so do, let's do the same with insects and and make sure that you try them and then afterwards you're gonna see that it wasn't a big deal and afterwards think about this as a gourmet type of meal that you're gonna eat that is helping the world so it's gonna be a higher quality so at the beginning it's gonna be more expensive we have to deal with it and afterwards if you start eating it more frequently and encouraging other people to eat them, they're gonna the prices are gonna go down. And we promise that we're gonna do our best so we can actually yes. <laughs> make it cheaper than traditional proteins. We are on the way to to do that. Um, but it usually takes the the help of the consumption. And if we have um, consumers focus on on a good solution on something, or basically consumers caring about what they're eating, that can shape the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Um, and just linked to this question, what kind of products are you currently selling? Like what <laughs> form do you put insects in? How do we how, how do we make that accessible? Well, basically, we started uh, Costa Rica with the cricket powder, which was uh, an easier way to include this material into other products. So you could actually make uh, any type of bakery product from mm -hmm. bread to cookies, crackers, uh, brownies. Uh, biscuits and pancakes. You know, pancakes, whatever you can think of. It's a matter of being creative as well. Um, but the, that's the type of product that we were developing at that stage. Um, on terms of consumption, we started this vision in the in the UK called Be Bite Foods, uh, which now we have separated from SIBO uh, because of the regulatory struggles that we were facing. So the products that we're developing on that end for the, for the consumer are brownie bites, what we called are kind of like crackers combined into a brownie. So um, we're trying to make the typical guilty pleasure become a healthy pleasure. Uh, we also have crackers and a bakery mix so you can actually cook whatever you want uh, <laughs> at home. At now that we are all at home, that's a good way to be entertained a little bit. And, and all of the, the products are focused on having at least 20% protein, at the same that have fiber, well, yeah, fiber, healthy fats, and it's low in sugar or without sugar at all. So we are making just a sustainable, healthy, and of course, delicious product in, at Be Bite. Thank you guys. So cool. It sounds like we can have a full breakfast meal of just <laughs> insects. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> we need a restaurant, you know, we need a full menu of just... I would like the insect please. Thank you, please. <laughs> um, that would sorry? No, that would be great to have yeah, like I'm there. <laughs> um, what kind of insects are you currently using? And what's the consumer attitude feeling about consuming insects? Okay. Um, in Costa Rica, we're farming crickets, uh, house cricket. Uh, it's called Acheta domesticus, Acheta domesticus and uh, the nebri monitor, which is the yellow mealworm. Those are the ones that are mostly, most consumed in the, in the Western countries and that are mostly accepted as well. Overall, the, cons the consumer perception, I don't know if you want to say it as a marketer or I, I can share, it has been great. There has been a lot of people about asking, like, like being cautious at the beginning, but then, trying out the powder even, um, and the, the products as they are, just loving it. Um, the main 
concern that we've gotten was that they wouldn't eat like with the people that we've talked they wouldn't eat the whole insect i mean if you can see like the whole insect as it is but made into a cookie a bar a protein shake whatever in any other form they're in <laughs> easy sounds great <laughs> I think we can get into some more businessy questions. Um, how are you financed? Do you have any difficulties in accessing finance compared to a non-sustainable company? Well, this is this is a question that has different parts because it depends on, on what market are you located. If we think about the UK, well, you have it really easy. Uh, starting with it's a matter of of risk, right? And in Latin American countries, the risk starts with just uh, having to make an investment out of your pocket to incorporate a company, which is quite expensive. It's over a thousand dollars, and sometimes the, the initial structure is not enough. Uh, you have to start paying taxes from day one. Um, there is no encouragement from day one for these type of companies because there is no the, there is no one that knows the figure of a startup, just mm -hmm. as of an SME. So you have to wait. Uh, around two years to be able to comply with the regulation. Um, and, you know, 80% of the companies are failing in the first two years. So, yeah, it's, it's a struggle. So in the UK and Europe, it's actually really easy. And that's why you see the development of the economy being better. It's a matter of, of uh, what perspective you have about business. And in Latin America, usually, there are a lot of countries who think that business are bad and people with business are rich people. So <laughs> yeah, and which is usually not the the, the truth. Um, but so we learned that we needed to come out of Costa Rica to have access to finance, to have access to additional support, and that's why we explored the UK and the Netherlands. And we also explored the US. Uh, in the beginning, we had the company registered in the US um, because of the conditions of the country um, and their perspective towards being more market. Uh, focused and more uh, focused towards uh, feeding animals instead of people, we decided to come to Europe because we could uh, actually be having access to investors who were more knowledgeable about this subject and about the type of technology we wanted to develop. So it has been a challenge, but once the investors understand that this is a matter of what technological solutions we can develop out of insects instead of oh, it's so nice, it's just an insect, or it's just cricket powder, um, that changes the perspective. Of course, um, we have a great challenge because there are not so many investors who understand this, but at the same time, works as a filter for us to do business with people who are actually understanding impact and are understanding the market. Mm -hmm. I would, I would also add, sorry, Charlotte, um, <laughs> it's, it's really important as well to understand what type of uh, I mean, if you have need, investment needs, like what is what is that need that you have? Uh, what is the type of investor that you're looking for? So, I mean, just taking that that into account before actually like reaching out to potential investors or any other. Yeah, and it's important to understand that you don't have to be uh, looking for fame or to become a an unicorn. Here, the the type of of focus should be. How much control are you willing to give in order to make your vision come through? That's the whole thing at the end of the day. You need money, everybody needs money, uh, but how much control are you willing to give in order to make that vision come true? Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. It's really, really cool hearing like you guys have such a global perspective and you've explored so many different countries. So everything you, that you've, you've been saying is so valuable, um, especially to students who might be thinking about working overseas. Um, you're definitely providing a really realistic <laughs> overview of working in different countries would be like. Um, another great question is for Daniela. What are your biggest, what are the biggest obstacles you face as a female entrepreneur? Oh, okay, great question. Um, I would say that the first main obstacle is personal, it's internal, to believe in yourself and actually like realizing what you're doing and that you can actually change uh, the status quo and um, inspire other people. So 
that's the first one like believing in yourself and what you're what you're capable of doing and the and it relates to the second well to the other obstacles that i've i think i've faced um because this confidence in yourself will actually make you well stand out or be able well it will take you to the place that you need to be so if you are in a well if we were on an event with a lot of people and investors and stakeholders now virtually but um in the past that it was physical um this confidence and this trust and this understanding of what you can do will give you the tools to reach to this person and to talk and to convince them as well to join your your cause so i think that's basically it but it's for me it has been more internal yeah that's really interesting thank you so much um another great question is in your view do you think sustainability and environmental change begins with the consumer or the institutions that have profited off the way the food industry has been built well i i think it depends um where it starts i think it starts with you first mm -hmm. to realize that and asking this question is, is a really good place to start yeah um but if you are just trying to complain about the corporates uh because of the bad that they did and, and just trying to fight them well you're gonna get lost in that fight and nobody's gonna make progress mm -hmm. so there are companies as shell for example one of the biggest petrol companies in the world um who had created so many challenges for the sustainability of the world now they are changing their business model understanding that the consumer is asking them to be more sustainable and to change everything so they are going into they want to become the biggest uh, green uh, energy company in the world so that's encouraging of course they are not saints they, they are not perfect but the fact that they're trying to change means that this change is going to create a lot of impact the bigger they are and the major uh, damage they, they are doing, the bigger opportunity for change there, there is. That's why we actually want to create this type of solution for companies like Unilever, Nestle, uh, Amcor, and, and other big uh, food corporates. So we can actually help them uh, innovate, move faster towards creating a better world. Um, the bigger the, the problem, the bigger the opportunity. So I think it's a matter of starting the on the point that it's closer to you mm -hmm. yes and i would also say that every action even if, if it's small or that we think that it's small it matters and it will change eventually so even if we say oh this will not make any any change at all it will so keep doing it and and yeah just stick with it even if if if, if, if even if you think it's small mm -hmm. wow thank you guys um, another really good question is, when it comes to building sustainable food systems, do you see the most impactful change coming from the bottom up through individual behavior or implemented from the top down? Kind of related to the last one. Bottom up. <laughs> yeah. Definitely bottom up. Um, we definitely see that. <laughs> and, and we believe that in the basis of the production, it's where we can have the most impact and it will lead Towards, towards making the most significant change um, in, the, in the big picture. It relates to the other question of uh, how can you help insects become uh, mainstream? It, it is a matter of the consumer behavior. How, what do you ask for? What are you consuming? Maybe you're complaining too much in social media about the sustainability and many companies pollute in the world, but when you go to the supermarket, you go for the cheapest option and you don't care about what you're consuming or you keep going to uh, these food uh, companies every day without caring about what you're eating or where they're bringing it from. So it's, you care with your money. Put your money where your mouth is, basically. And I would also say that it's important to be shifting towards a more circular way of thinking in this food systems, not necessarily just up and down, because we need to make make a circle out of it and... and um, and this is when we also relate to good True. business is good for everyone. A 360 yeah. type of solution. 360 solution. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we have time for one more question. 
Um, do you think there's a significant challenge in re regarding people's perceptions of consuming consuming insects? If so, how do you think we can tackle it? Well, yeah, there are a lot of, of challenges there. Um, but usually people ask this question uh, from people, international people, because they think Costa Rica is a big insect consumer, which is not at all. Costa Rica <laughs> no. um, is very different. This, the story of, of our country is very different, different because all the native Costa Ricans were killed by the Spanish conquerors. So we don't have that much connection to our native Costa Ricans. That's why also we decided to call the that company Cebu to remember what was important, to remember the roots. Um, but at the end of the day, we have a culture or a consumer behavior that is more similar to the U.S. consumer behavior than to the rest of Latin America. And so it's, it is a challenge just starting with our families even. Um, when we started to produce insects, my mom is one of the biggest detractors of this industry. <laughs> she she actually hates insects so much, she's, she's really scared. And I remember one of the challenges was making her consume the insects first. And I remember we tried it with a pancake. We, yeah. we made an amazing pancake. Uh, it was really good. Um, I invited her to try it, but she didn't know it was insects. She tried it and just right when she was in the middle of the pancake and, and she was loving it, um, I told her that it had insects. And then her face it was a combination of, of emotions, fear, um, she felt, of course, cheated. Um, but so she went running to her room and then like immediately she came back to finish up the pancake because it was a shock at the beginning, but then she broke that barrier on, I'm just gonna get it. I'm liking what I'm eating. Is there, I'm not seeing any insect, it's healthy, so why not? And that's pretty much the, the approach that we are trying to have with anybody is a matter of being tasty, being healthy, and being sustainable. And that's pretty much the, uh, the slogan of our company in the UK, <laughs> be like foods, be healthy, be sustainable, but be tasty. Because at the end of the day, no matter, we eat because we like, and we like <laughs> enjoying what we're eating. I love that. I'd love to be given an insect pancake. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for you guys. So your insects are farmed in Costa Rica, right? Yeah. Um, but if you're selling in Europe, how do you offset the emissions from transporting your goods? Are you guys making an active effort? Because um, obviously there's so many different ways, you know, car like the footprint the, of your product. How do you yeah, offset that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's a matter again about thinking of 360 solutions and, and Daniela as a CEO has been looking for partners, uh, uh, logistic partners that are uh, green, that are aligned with this uh, vision of course. It's a matter of, and, and I think that's why the food industry creates so much impact in the world because it's not only about eating, farming, uh, packaging, it's also transporting, it's also the partnering with other people. So it's a whole structure and something that we uh, understand is that, yes, there are going to be emissions on the, on the transport, but are those bigger than the ones that you're generating because of farming insects with electricity, using water, using another type of um, food for the insects? So mm -hmm. what we do is to commit with circular economy practices where 50% of our materials for farming processes are completely upcycled. Um, so, uh, and we also uh, decentralize the production and locate the, the factory in Costa Rica in a specific place. We don't use any electricity or water in the farming process, it's just natural. Um, and at the end of the day here, we try to trade with the cleanest uh, manufacturers and uh, logistic partners. And that's basically all we can do at this moment, but it's yes. a matter of a solution that we have to build all together. And well, with this is also an opportunity for a logistic company to be greener. So yes. <laughs> tell us about it. We're gonna go ahead and partner with those ones. It's a great opportunity as well. <laughs> sure. I mean, I hope they're listening right now. <laughs> um, and one more, just quickly for all the students watching, do you offer opportunities for students to intern or volunteer with you? 
Yes, of course we do. Um, you can send us an email, basically. Yeah, the email is talent at cbot.tech. And basically, we are making posts on our social media when we are going to meet someone. But something that we love is that uh, just pitch the idea, pitch yourself, pitch your talent. It's the same thing that we have to do as an entrepreneur. Maybe we're not looking for someone, but um, we haven't met you. Yeah, and maybe you can know. bring some value that we didn't know. <laughs> and it's a matter of selling, of selling yourself. Um, but something really important is that the people that we have on our team right now are people that have come that way. The people who stay on our team are people yes. who care enough to don't care <laughs> of sending or being rejected or failing in the yes. process. So, and they are here because they care, they have been able to develop, and we don't care too much about the knowledge, the initial knowledge or- the Background, or, yeah. academic background or, yeah. It's a matter of having this purpose alignment with uh, the, the purpose that we have in the company. Yes. Yeah, so feel free. I mean, if you if you would like to stay connected with us, of course, just send us an email. And of course, follow us and we don't have, well, we can have your website, we can send your website and the Facebook page. Which is and we're website. definitely going to be looking for someone in the UK uh, with a background in food uh, operations, having access to food manufacturers, retailers. So that's basically something that we're going to be looking for, potentially as a, a key partner or another type of co-founder there. So a lot of opportunities to come. Yes. Amazing. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you guys so, so much. I do have some things for the students watching. Um, first, I would like to share, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, Sussex has a lot of great resources. One, one second. Um, for example, the Career Equity Project. Um, oh my gosh. The Career Equity Project, if you go down, you can see there's a lot of different talks going on for the rest of the week and going into April and March, which are really exciting. Um, and Sussex also has a page. Sorry, I'm going to have to share another screen. <laughs> um, here we go. Um, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, please do refer to um sussex at sussex.ac.uk slash careers entrepreneurship if you're interested in becoming an entrepreneur or learning more about what it means to be an entrepreneur sussex has a lot of really really great resources and one second don't forget guys that tomorrow is the last make an impact event it will take place at 4 p.m gmt the talk will be given by Chloe Mukai, who will be discussing what the United Nations is doing to promote sustainable and ethical fashion, which is something that's also going to be really, really interesting. And I hope to see all of you there. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you, actually. Thank you. It was a pleasure.